real pleasure to be here. Uh, I focus on pediatric spine, among other uh, pediatric orthopedic problems. I uh, work in Osyut. I'm still lecturer of orthopedic surgery, soon to be an assistant professor, hopefully. We'll see about that. So I don't, I don't want to take so much time. I would uh, start with... Uh, my talk is about classification of early onset scoliosis. Uh, I'd like to introduce the, uh, the term early onset scoliosis because it has developed over time. It is the progressive spinal deformity, regardless of the etiology, in a child younger than 10 years of age. This definition has been adopted by so many societies dealing with um, pediatric scoliosis. It is a group of heterogeneous uh, pathologies. Uh, they share the age in common, but they are really very different with different associations, comorbidities, prognoses, and natural history. Back then in 2012, when I was writing up my thesis about pediatric scoliosis, uh, there was the issue of early onset scoliosis, of course, and then the need to classify the need to classify early onset scoliosis. There had, we had no classification of uh, of early onset scoliosis by then. Why do we need to classify? We need to classify because this stratifies patients according to their pathologies and their natural histories and their problems, anatomical locations and otherwise. It does create a common language or a uniform language for surgeons to deal with each other and speak to each other, defining certain things certain ways. Uh, this um, makes communication very easy. It generates, it helps generate high level evidence because we're all talking about the same thing. And then this at the end guides treatment in the best interest of the patient. This paper was published in 12, 2014 by a great bunch of uh, pediatric uh, spine surgeons who actually set up or have, have been setting up a classification system for early onset scoliosis, and they managed to do so in 2014. Uh, this paper is the baseline of this, um, this lecture. First of all, we see the age on the extreme left. We start with the left side, on the left side, age of the patient, and then the etiology going from above downward. If the patient has a congenital or structural anomaly in the spine or the chest cage, or the body in general, like hemihypertrophy, it, suits, it, su it should sit in the first category. If the patient is neuromuscular, syndromic, or idiopathic, then we, you allot it to uh, its specific area. Major curve angles are stratified according to severity. Kyphosis is, is, shift, is, is divided into three categories, either in negative or normal, which is 20 to 50 degrees of kyphosis, or plus, which is more than 50. And then there's the APR modifier. The APR modifier is the progression, the annual progression ratio, which decides if this curve is rapidly progressive, I need to intervene, or is it slowly progressive, I can delay surgery for another year or two. As I just said, I won't go through the whole slide, but structural or congenital anomalies put the patient in the C group like hemivertebra fused ribs, of course, but other stuff like thoracogenic scoliosis after thoracotomy, after correction of congenital heart disease, um, other congenital problems like um, hemihypertrophy, dystrophic neurofibromatosis, these are strong structural changes that affect the spine and doesn't really have to be only congenital, but other structural anomalies do sit in this group. Neuromuscular, of course, there's the high, um, high uh, tone, or the low tone neuromuscular problems. We all know these like um, SMAs, muscular dystrophy, spina bifida, CP, of course, and other pathologies. Syndromic, these are other syndromes that are known to be associated with scoliosis, but do not actually directly lead to scoliosis, like Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, arthrogryposis. These are, these are many syndromes, and they are specifically written up in this paper I just shared. The annual progression ratio is calculated according to the curve progression every year. So it's the major, it needs two time points. So you see the patient at time point one, and then you see him again at time point two with at least six months in between. And then you put the major curve at time two, I'm sorry, time two, minus the major curve at time one, and then you divide over time in years. So you get the progression of the angle in years. Kyphosis is the maximum measurable kyphosis between any two levels in the lateral view of the spine. 
In mixed cases, like if you have a, a CP patient with a hemivertebra, so is this a neuromuscular or is this a congenital? You allot it actually to the upper level. So you choose to put it in the congenital group. If you have a spina bifida patient with multiple congenital anomalies, among which are some hemivertebrae as well, or fused ribs, you put it in the congenital, not the neuromuscular group, and so on. I'd like to give examples on how to use the classification system. So we have a girl, six years old, with muscular dystrophy, uh, who presented with a curve of 18 degrees and kyphosis of 70, seven degrees, all right? So looking at her age, I put her a six here. She's muscular dystrophy, she's, a, she's an M. Major curve is 18, it's less than 20, so she takes one. Kyphosis is seven, is less than 20, so she takes a minus. And then we need a second point in time to put the APR. She comes again 14 months later with a major curve of 33 and a kyphosis of two degrees. So her initial classification was a 6M1 minus. And then we need to allot the second classification. So she's, um, she comes 17 months, 14 months later, so one year and two months. So she takes a seven. Etiology is still an M. Major curve has progressed into 33, so she takes a two. Kyphosis is still on the negative range. And then the APR modifier is the amount of progression divided by time. So if you have 14 months, you need to multiply by 12 to get the months, and then she develops by 15. and into 20 degrees of progression every year. A second example, so her second classification is 7M2 minus P1. It's a difficult language to speak, but it takes learning. When you learn it, you can actually say one thing and everyone will understand what you mean. It, it does take time into consideration. It does tell you it's progressive. It does tell you, no, it's not progressive. So you can actually do a lot of things with this classification. Case example number two, a four-year-old girl with myopathy, nemaline myopathy, has a major curve of 35 and kyphosis of 42 degrees. So let's see, she's a four. Her etiology is a myopathy, so she is an M2. A major curve is 35, she's two. Kyphosis is a lot this time, but it's still in the normal range, so it's an N. And then she comes three years later, which is 36 months later, with a major curve of 80. She's seven now, curve is M is still her initial diagnosis. Major curve is now a three. Kyphosis is now a plus. And then the modifier, the APR uh, or the annual progression ratio equals 15 degrees a year. So that gives her a one as well. All right. So now her second classification is seven M3 plus P1. People have used this classification since 2014, and it has shown excellent or very good inter-observer and intra-observer reliability. Some papers like Park, and, uh, Park et al. in 2017 have shown that those, the red, this is a survival uh, chart, the red ones are the M4Ns. So they are the neuromuscular, four with a high curve, normal kyphosis or within... As you can see, the idiopathics, the, sorry, the congenital three with a minus kyphosis are the only extreme side on the right side of the chart, which means they survive longer without loss of the proximal fixation. Another uh, paper in 2020 speaks of unplanned return to the OR, which has shown actually similar plus side of the kyphosis, then the congenital, which we've seen on the earlier curve, and then the neuromuscular with normal kyphosis. Uh, Akbarnia has, has just actually published a paper in November. Uh, he says that using traditional grown rods showed no difference at all across the whole chart of, of uh, types of early onset scoliosis. And uh, he did use the in that classification of 2014 in his study. So to sum up, 
all I want to say that a classification system now exists. It's important to, to know it and keep developing it. It does have good inter-observer and intra-observer reliability. It has been validated, keeps on becoming validated more and more. And if a better thing um, appears, it will be used. It helps research, it helps take care, taking care of patients, and it creates a common language